Okay, positions please, ladies and gentlemen. Mm. I, I am in the hot seat. It is hot sure. in that seat, yeah. I'm in the cool seat. Yeah. You can swap if you want. I've never done an interview like this. It's very bizarre. Speaking, All right. Speaking into the void. That was the first time for everything, and I guess yep. this is this one. Okay, I'm gonna start off with a very complex, unusual question. Why and how did you become an actor? Why and how did I become an actor? Uh, well, I met, a few years ago, I met Seymour Cassell, who was uh, uh, kind of some fame for being an actor in John Cassavetti's films. And he said to me, when he met me, he said, who left you, your mother or your father? And uh, his point being that any actor uh, was left by somebody and that they're seeking some kind of attention. So maybe that's true. Uh, that might be the why of it. The how of it would be that um, what I always really wanted to be was uh, a writer. And um, when I was a very young man, doors opened up for me as an actor. Uh, I got a scholarship to college because of acting. Um, I hated college and I left because of an audition for acting and I got the part in Dead Poets Society and that kind of changed my life. I wasn't sure. My real fantasy at that time period was to be like Jack London and um, sign up on a freight ship or something and disappear for five years and come back with a novel. I think that was what I wanted at 18. But this opportunity to act in movies came up. How did that come up? Um, because you did Explorers before Dead Poets. Yeah, right? on, a, on a complete lark, I went as a kid. I'd met another child actor who went in auditions, and I asked my mother if I could go on. She said yes, and I got the part in the movie, which was an incredible strain on my family and on my life when I was, I was 13 years old. So I did it. It was an isolated incident in my childhood. Uh, you know, five months or something, I went away and did it. It was kind of like going away to summer camp. And, um, and then I went back to high school and everything, but the agent that I had met then called me up when I was off at college to say that there was a very special movie that was happening and that she had recommended me to them. And so I came in, I was going to college in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, and I, took the bus into New York and auditioned. And I ended up uh, getting the part. And so that opened up a ton of doors for me. Uh, it, I mean, that's, it, people use the expression changed my life pretty uh, cavalierly, but that really did. I mean, uh, the, the movie was a phenomenal international success and my whole life trajectory kind of went like that. All of a sudden I was an actor. Um, did you have, did you audition for Peter Weir? Yeah. Not, not originally. Yeah. I had several auditions before I got to audition. Did for you know Peter. who he was? Did I know who he was? I, you know, not really. I'd seen Witness, I think. I was only 18 years old. I didn't know much. Would you say he's, he's a major figure in your life? Yeah. He was a giant mentor to me, much in the same way that Robin Williams' character in Dead Poets Society made this huge impact on those students and what that whole movie is about. Peter Weir was our Mr. Keating. Uh, he taught us about the arts. He taught us that it was possible to do something and make a difference. He taught us that that only came from serious hard work and serious study. And, um, and he showed us how to have a good time and be creative. And I didn't know what a special experience that was when I was having it. I mean, I knew I was having a good time, but I didn't know how rare it was. It would be, it would be five or six years later until I did uh, Before Sunset, Before Sunrise, um, that I would have a similar kind of creative experience as I had on Dead Poets Society. I mean, you know, I, I wrote scenes for Dead Poets Society with the other actors. We all did. We, we were encouraged to contribute on a, on a uh, massive level. And it was wildly empowering. Because you didn't think that uh, anything you wrote or contributed would actually get into the final film? Or it was just surprising that somebody Nobody cared what I thought or wrote. 
before. Like, nobody cares what any 18-year-old thinks. Or It's a very uh, powerful experience to have a serious person, a grown-up who has achieved something in the world, say, I'm interested in what you're thinking. It makes you pay attention to what you're thinking. Do you know what I mean? Uh, it was thrilling for all of us. In fact, in many ways, it, it, it's been a real handicap for all of us. <laughs> Just because, uh, I, mean, it, it, I mean that as a joke. I mean, it, it was inspiring and life-changing. But it's, it's never been as easy as that. Peter Weir made things very easy. What was the um, camaraderie amongst, the, amongst you guys, amongst the actors? On Dead Poets Society? We're still, a, a lot of us are very close. I mean, Robert Schoen Leonard and Josh Charles are two actors who are in that movie with me who I'm still very close with. And, um, you know, I'm often, you often see some young actor break out onto the cinema, the world of movies, you know, whether it's Julia Roberts or whoever. And, and for me, it was incredibly easy because it was buffered by, we were just one of the kids of Dead Poets Society. You weren't Matthew McConaughey or Julia Roberts or Matt Damon or, you know. Um, and it, 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 it taught us a certain humility and a, a certain understanding of it. It gave us a lot of success without too much success. You know, I, I don't know how those other people handle that level of success that young or that instantaneously. Um, and we also had this mentor to walk us through it. You know, Peter Weir took us all to the Venice Film Festival. And, you know, we got to learn about publicizing a movie. He taught us that even though we were getting a lot of attention, that the movie wasn't that good. Do you know that oftentimes getting a tremendous amount of success is, uh, is only a sign of mediocrity? And that um, if you're doing something really, really excellent, that they probably won't notice. He, he was a very fascinating, he is a very fascinating person. Have you wanted or had the opportunity or near missed an opportunity to work with him again? Or would you like to? Or is this... Oh, I would love to, but... Um, he checks in with all of us. Every time he's in New York, he'll come see me in a play or something like that. Or um, I send him things I've written and he responds. And we have a nice relationship. Why do you think the film's in endured so much? Dead Poets Society? Uh, it's just a timeless idea. Carpe diem. Young people trying to understand themselves and make a mark is perennial. Uh, every generation has their form of, of that struggle. I don't know. I hope it has endured. I, I have no real awareness of that. With things that you're in, I just know people still ask me about it. So I guess it, I, I guess it has. Does it bother you they ask you about it so much? Or you no, I love it. I love it. I'm, it's, it's like... Uh, people asking you about your schoolmates and uh, I, it, I feel incredibly blessed that that was an experience I got to have. And I don't think I, I fully understand how much it's formed me. I don't know if I would have ever had the guts to write if that weren't the experience I had. That, you know, that whole movie is about following your bliss, you know, about you know, someday you'll be dead. So there's no use in wasting time worrying about what you're going to think about me. I need to think about my own ethics and my own belief system, and I need to follow it. And um, that's a powerful thing to have instilled in you and also in getting famous for, you know, so whenever any, anybody talks to you about it, you know. Uh, Did you find yourself getting cast as sensitive types? Thereafter? You know, casting is always stupid. I mean, people are silly in that they just want to... I mean, this is an industry. The film world is an industry. People want to make money. Um, and so they want to cast you as something that you've done before. When I did Dead Poet Society, everybody wanted to cast me as a young, sensitive prep school kid. And then you do uh, Reality Bites, and you're like some kind of Generation X grunge guy. And then you do Training Day, and then you're a cop. You know? Uh, it's, that's the silliness of casting, is labeling people. You are whatever you are in the moment. You have a Exactly, film. until you're something else, and then, oh, okay. What is Generation X? Well, I, 
guess Generation X is the generation that came of age in the early 90s. You know, that's what I guess it is. I don't think it has any meaning beyond that. Um, if you ask me about it, I think it's Nirvana. It's Douglas Copeland's book, the start of the expression. It's slacker. So it's a lot of kind of great art. It's kind of um, uh, a movement of young people that came out of apathy. You know, people not, I mean, it's a different time now. Like the, the world is in, technology is moving the world so fast. You know, there's all kinds of war all over the world. And um, the good thing about living in such a terrible time period as right now is that it's very good for the arts because it enforces, you know, when there's, you're, you know, I'm from the United States of America and our, my country's bombing Iraq and bombing Afghanistan all over the world. It, it makes people ask certain deeper questions and that's kind of good for the artistic world. But um, in the 90s, there was all this apathy. There was all this wealth and feeling like nothing made a difference. And, uh, and that's, you know, Nirvana is probably the most beautiful embodiment of all that. I mean, the film was directed by Ben Stiller. You co-starred with Winona Ryder. I mean, hot young stars, for want of a better expression at the time. Did you feel like a hot young star, for want of a better expression at the time? I don't think like that. I always feel like a hot young star, on the other hand. You know what I mean? Why not? <laughs> Why not? You know? Um, I mean, I say that in jest. Uh, I, it, it neither has any meaning nor doesn't have it. I mean, everyone should think of themselves as that. You know, um, uh, especially 23 years. I was 24, 23 or something like that when we did Reality Bites. So in a way, I thought I was pretty cool. But, um, but no, I didn't even want to do that movie. I, I, I... Why not? Um, I was dubious even at the time that uh, that they were going to commercialize this, they were. You know what, I, I think I didn't want to do it because I knew it would be successful. And I was wary of too much success. I, I, I didn't want it. I, I didn't think that uh, a serious artist would covet success. Um, and so I, I wasn't that interested in it. But I. I thought the script was pretty good, and I saw it on TV the other day, or 20 minutes of it, and it's a pretty funny movie, um, and I like it. Ben Stiller is very talented. You know, he hadn't done anything then, and it was interesting to meet him as a young man who had, like, ideas popping out of his ears. You knew that he was somebody uh, who was going to do well in this world. And, you know, Winona was uh, as big a star as they could be at that moment, so it was a hard job to turn down despite a great artist not coveting success, on the set or in that context, did you feel that you were a part of a something, it was a definitive Generation X movie with these people, you were a moment, you were part of your time? I felt like I was inside the zeitgeist. I did, yeah. I knew it when it came out, you know. I don't know how to explain that, but I, I you were aware of it. Do you ever allow um, fame to suck you in? Sure, sure. It's, I mean, fame is like money or sexuality or, it's neither good nor bad. Uh, it depends on how you use it, you know? Um, great uh, things can be accomplished with a certain amount of celebrity, you know? We get John Lennon and Bob Marley. I mean, if you want to focus on the arts, like, so people that use their celebrity to uh, really better the world. Um, and then there's the silly, vain side of celebrity. You know, everything's what you make of it. There's this silly side of everything, you know? Fame is, no, is nothing. It's like, you know, it's like, uh, like I said, it's like money or uh, power, um, strength. Uh, strength can either be good or bad, you know? Which of your films are personal favorites which you feel have been overlooked? The 
the fact that I'm in the privileged position of you asking me that question means I don't really feel that anything's been overlooked. I, I feel that things, you know, time is the ally of good films and good writing and good music. You know, you know what I mean? People will discover it over time. Gattaca is a, a film I'm very proud of that was very much ignored when it came out. I mean, it just came and went and it barely got a good review. In fact, I, I don't think in the United States it got one good review. I think like some small paper in Boston thought it was a good film. Why do you think that was? Because it is a good film, it's a beautifully crafted film. It's Andrew Nichols' first director. Yeah, and it, I think it's Andrew Nichols' debut, and I think it's one of the great sh first films of all time, really. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I think that, uh, first off, it was marketed like a sci-fi movie, and people were disappointed that there was no action in the movie. Um, it's a, I, I don't know, you know, the, the zeitgeist, as you call it, like is, why do people pay attention to Reality Bites and not Gattaca? Why do people love, you know, eh, what they love? I, I don't know. But time has been the friend of Gattaca. You know, people most often ask me about that. Um, before Sunrise and Before Sunset are probably the, you know, two movies that I'm in, intensely proud of. Uh, but I can't say they've been overlooked. Uh, you know, they've, they've been, people like those movies. And, uh, what do you like so much about Gattaca? Just to... It's a movie that, you know, not, not, not that differently from Dead Poet Society in a way. Its themes are that of uh, individual rights, what makes up an individual. Um, it's working, you know, so rarely do films uh, use the device of metaphor, you know, or allegory. And, um, and Gattaca really does it. And Gattaca was ahead of its time. All this stuff about genetic engineering and all the stuff that's happening now was a little, was a little ahead of its time. Um, it's, it has my most favorite line I've ever said in a movie, you know, which is I didn't save anything for the swim back. You know, at the, at the end, there, Ra the two brothers are racing in the ocean. And Why do you like the line so much? Ah. You know, it's like a George Bernard Shaw line, which is that uh, when I come to die, I hope to be thoroughly used up. You know, not holding anything back. You know, not letting fear make our decisions for us. So often, um, hope and fear are... Um, get in our way so much. We hope this will happen. We're scared that will happen. Um, so we, we hear what we hope to hear or we see what we're scared to see instead of seeing the truth or hearing the truth, you know. And um, uh, so, I don't know. It's a very, Gattaca is very, I don't know, it's beautiful. I don't know why I like it so much. I'll, maybe because I like Andrew Nichols so much. Or maybe I like it so much because it was ignored. You know, you tend to take for granted things that are successful. At what point did you start thinking about directing? I directed a short film when I was 20 years old. So I would have to say around then. Why did you do it? Why did you think about directing? You're an actor at that point, why direct? And you wanted to write. Because I didn't think of myself as an actor. You know, I, I was pretty sure, when I did Dead Poets Society, I was pretty sure that, that this acting thing was going to play itself out. You know, I didn't want to be like a, a washed up teenage star. You know, I was very dubious of all that success. Uh, and I was w very wary of it. And, and so I took my money from Dead Poets Society and I made a little short film called Straight to One, which uh, it's pretty, I like it. Um, uh, but it was kind of the first thing I really wrote, too. I'd written this short story, and um, an actor friend of mine had read it and said, you should, let's make this into a movie. I thought, all right. And um, it was a great experience. You know, I shot it in black and white, 16 millimeter, and I cut it myself back when you actually cut the film and tape it together. And I got to have that whole experience. Uh, 
I illegally scored it with Bob Dylan music. <laughs> That's why I can't ever show it anywhere. It's got all this Bob Dylan music all over it. And um, uh, the only reason to direct really was because the same reason to write. Um, I always felt it was really important to be engaged in life and to live. That if you're, if you're an actor, one of the dangers of acting is you just kind of go from film set to film set to film set and you start living this very isolated, weird life behind a glass wall. I mean, it's very hard for me already. I already live behind a glass wall a little bit, you know. I have to work very hard to break it down and make new friends and have people... Um, people love celebrity, you know. They like to hero worship, think people are better than them. They like to make fun of people for celebrities who go along with it, for believing that they're better than you, even though everybody tells you you're better than them. As soon as you buy it, they mock you. And it's a fun kind of elaborate game society likes to play with. It's scary to actually think we're all equal, you know, because it, it addresses some fundamental ideas that, you know, we orient our lives around accomplishment. And what is accomplishment? Making money. A lot of terrible people make money. A lot of the worst people in the world make money. So we know that's not the criteria for being a successful human being. But what is the criteria for being a successful human being? You know? I mean, these are like real questions. And, and celebrity is a way of kind of disguising it and masquerading it all. She's wonderful. Brad Pitt's amazing, you know? He's what I want to be. I don't have to be who I want to be because he's it, but I hate him because he's making love to women that I want to be making love to. And if I had his power, you know, whatever it is, you know, I don't know. I, I, I'm fascinated by it. And do you have those feelings in the regards of a person of heroes or John Lennon or Bob Marley or whoever? No, I try, <laughs> to, I try to compete with people who, um, who I really, really admire. You don't suffer from envy? Oh, God, what are you kidding? Uh, uh, who doesn't? I mean, maybe some people don't suffer from envy, but, you know, whenever any human being does something really amazing, it's hard not to feel that it uh, somehow reflects badly on you, you know, um, which is silly, um, because there's not one pie of great things that get to be done. We should just use it as inspiration, but... I, ha I learned a very pivotal lesson at a young age. My first movie, Explorers, was with, with River Phoenix, who uh, I thought was just incredible. And I suffered so much as a young man because I, I, I had stopped acting. As a, you know, we're talking a teenager now. I mean, just silliness. But, uh, and River went on to be wildly famous. And I admired him and envied him and was jealous of him so much that it was painful, you know, just, and then he died, and I wasn't any better, you know, I wasn't a better person because he wasn't around, I didn't get more jobs because he wasn't around, I wasn't better in the jobs, you know, in fact, I realized that I was st trying to be as good as he, how I imagined him, and I realized that, wow, he was a real ally of mine, and I looked at him as a you know, uh, as somebody who was in my way. Um, and I, so I learned kind of at a young age that, my mother always said that too, that human emotions all have value and you can learn from them, except jealousy. Jealousy is just a simple waste of time and that more ill is done in the world because of jealousy than for anything else. And we all suffer from it. It is true, yes. Jealousy arrogance and indifference. Yeah, those are, yeah, I would agree with that. Going back to directing for a second, when you direct the short film and the two films you subsequently made, do you have the voices of directors you work with that, uh, or are you trying to create, do you try and create your own identity <laughs> as a director? You know, there's a reason why so many actors make really good directors, you know, I mean, uh, the history is paved with it as opposed to people coming and it's because we've gotten to work with so many other directors. Most directors, like, you know, I'm friends with Richard Linkletter. He's never been on a set that he wasn't directing. I mean, maybe he stopped by one, but he's never. Um, 
So he doesn't really know what other film sets are like. Peter Weir doesn't know what a Richard Linkletter film set is like. And he can't, he just knows his own ethics and his own way of working. And I know what they're both like. And I know what, gosh, you know, how would Peter handle the situation? How would Rick handle the situation? How would Alfonso Caron handle the situation? Do you know? Um, and, and you see these amazing things. Like I could watch how Andrew Nichol worked with designers. Andrew Nichol loves designers. How should this light look? And how should that set? Maybe the stairway should look like a genetic code itself. Wouldn't that be amazing? You know? And Richard Linklater doesn't really care about designers that much. He's more interested in the truth of some kind of human truth. He doesn't want to get away from any distractions, not about something inside here. And, um, Alfonso loves color and flash. And, you know, he's, he's, and I'm simplifying them all, obviously. They, they all like lots of things. But largely what I have done as a director is uh, He's taking the negatives of what they did and try not to do them. Do you, you know, like, uh, such and such director always was late to the set, so I'll never be late to the set, because I knew how annoying that was. It's, it's hard, though, because you, as soon as you start comparing yourself to other people, you're lost, really. You, you have to just find your own voice and, and hope by osmosis the good stuff gets in and the bad stuff leaves you. But what I was trying to say, really, is that I've learned more from the bad directors I've worked with than the good ones. Because the good ones are just following their own heart, and that's hard to do. There's no recipe for that. But you can pinpoint some things that you knew were destructive to the creative process. You know? What drew you to Hamlet 2000? Well, it's called, is it called Hamlet, Hamlet 2000? Sometimes I feel like in other countries it's called Hamlet 2000. But um, in the US it was called Hamlet or it's taken on the name Hamlet 2000 because in video land, you need to know what they are. Uh, Hamlet, you know, uh, Michael Amoreda is a really interesting uh, experimental filmmaker. And if you're, an, if you're interested in acting at all and somebody offers you the role of Hamlet, you just say yes, you know, I mean, why not? You, someday you'll be dead, you know, you might as well do it. That's how I felt. It was so much fun to work on that to sit there and study the play and watch other productions of the play. I'd get all these videotapes, read John Gilgood's notes and Richard Burton's diary. You know, he has a ball. I mean, you know, it's this archetype character. Um, and, uh, and Michael was really smart. And what really worked for me was the fact that Michael Almereta had an idea about the play. So many, the problem with so many Hamlets, I think, is it's Rafe finds his Hamlet. You know, so-and-so's Hamlet. So, there's no reason to do the play except to see Ray Fiennes do it. Daniel Day-Lewis, right, you know, whoever it is. Richard Burton, John Gilbert. It's like Michael had an idea about what the play was about and how it could be relevant to a contemporary society. And it was a neat idea. And so that made the movie about something more than my performance, which was very helpful because I'm not that kind of actor that I'm... I can make it exciting all by myself. How did you come up with, how did you all come up with this business where you had a voiceover would then go into you in vision speaking and then coming back out? We just had a ball adapting the piece. Michael had this beautiful idea that, <laughs> that one of the most existential moments he'd ever had was in the video store, trying to decide what video to rent. And as a filmmaker, just seeing the thousands of films that have been made already and what difference does it make and what should I watch and why, do I, why am I even alive? I'm just wasting my time. And so he had this idea of setting to be or not to be speech in, um, in a video store, which is a riot. And I knew that there was a real, I didn't know how do you start to be or not to be. It's so silly. And, and so we came up with this idea of, well, what if we never really do? It's like, I... You watch me watching myself film myself do that speech. It's, it gets so abstract that um, it's a way of avoiding the, you know, to be or not to be. Because somehow that always made me laugh. In 1998, you made Great Expectations with the great 
Alfonso Cuaron. Yes. How did you feel about the film? What was it like working with him? Alfonso and I had a terrible time together. Uh, I've never fought with a director like I fought with Alfonso. Um, he talked me into doing the movie. I did the movie because I met him and I thought, wow, this is one of the most talented people I've ever met. Um, but his English wasn't great at the time. <laughs> and he is an exasperating individual. Um, uh, he, his ideas about great expectations were so exciting. I don't even remember what they were. I just remember sitting there across from him in some bar in New York as he was telling me how beautiful this movie was going, God. But they all related to the camera. They didn't really relate to the actor. And so I really struggled with him. I, I, I felt like a poseur in that movie, do you know? I felt like I was just there to look pretty and hit my mark and I was coming off before sunrise, which I felt uh, like a real collaborator. Um, and Alfonso's a bully, you know? The camera's going to go in on you and then we're going to get the crane and we're going to pull out and then you're going to run over here and you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, this, you know, I, I struggled with him. Um, and he would tell you, I think, that some of the reasons that I struggled, I was justified in. And some of them I was not. Versus it's scary to go on like David Letterman or something like that. Because, son, you know, you, if you've ever watched the show, you know sometimes people come off like a big jerk, you know? And, um, no, yeah, they, you always feel like, uh, it looks like you're a bit of a, not punch bag, but you're sort of... Yeah, like you might come off like a real he ass. Wants to bounce his stuff off you. Exactly. I always feel that would be actually terrifying, because you're supposed to be, you got, how, much, how much time do you get on Letterman? On Letterman, like 10 minutes. Yeah. I've been on it once, the first time I was ever on it, I, I'm white as a ghost. I'm petrified. And um, I remember uh, Richard Linkletter told me to, because I was really nervous about it, he goes, just pretend to be like, Pick, make up a character and try, so I like, oh, it was just a disaster. I said some really stupid things that weren't funny, trying to be funny. But everybody laughed anyway. No, they didn't, they sadly, didn't. it was awful. <laughs> I wanted to vomit. And that's the one only time you've done that? Or? No, I made myself do it again, about, like last year, just to try to get over it, because it was a horrifying experience. Are we back on? Are we back on? We are back on. Um. One thing I want to say about Alfonso Caron before we go on is that I wouldn't be so candid as to say that we had such a bad experience if I didn't think it was clear how much I admire him. I mean, I've never gotten along worse with a director in my life, but E2 Mama Tambien is probably my favorite movie made in the 90s. And uh, I loved uh, Children of Men and uh, all his films, with the exception of the one I'm in, um, I think are awesome. And I think he's a, a beautiful man. Um, I would love, I wish he was here tonight and we could have dinner. But working with him was a nightmare and I can't pretend it wasn't. Yeah, no, I had quite a lengthy interview with him. Did you have? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> you know why that means. Uh, no, we got on very well, actually. Good. I, I wasn't acting. <laughs> but you could see that he's a quite passionate person and that when you lock horns with him, it's, you, you lock horns. So, labels. Actor, director, writer, musician, doctor, lawyer, beggar man, thief. Do you think they define us too much? As you obviously seem to wish to swim. I've always tried to avoid labels. I mean, maybe it was because you remember in Don't Look Back, the Dylan documentary, you know, they say like, there's a folk singer, and he's, I'm not a folk singer. I'm a song and dance man, you know. Uh, the only troubles with labels is that if you buy into them, do you know, if you are, I know so many people that could probably write a great novel if they would believe in themselves enough to do it. Do you know, our own editing of our own mind, our own fear that we're not good enough, that we're not smart enough, that we're not, um, why would anybody care what I think? That doesn't matter. Nobody needs to care what you think. It matters if you, 
what you want to do. Um, but so that's the only reason. I, mean, I don't mind. And the older I've gotten, the more, you know, people ask me what I am. I say I'm an actor, you know. That's what people know me as. You know, I'm lots of things. I'm a father. I'm a, you know, a, you know. But, but they don't need to know that. They, they just see the guy who's in the movies. And that's all they care about. Before sunrise, before sunset, the inevitable question is how autobiographical are those films in terms of the character? Well, both those movies are seeped in Julie and Richard and myself, like they're ours, you, you know? I mean, uh, I don't know, autobiographical, Whenever you say that, it, it implies that that it's all true, you know, and it, it's not. But we're certainly using ourselves. You know, I always felt like I'm playing Rick, and Rick feels like you know he's capturing me or something. I don't know. Um, there's some strange thing, and then Rick and I are both championing Julie. You know, we Julie Delpy has always been the you know, the secret ace of that collaboration. She's the magic of that collaboration. Um, she's the inspiration, she's the muse of it. Um, uh, people don't know what an excellent writer and what an excellent mind she has. And her, it's her unique genius is what makes those movies take off to my mind. It's what makes them special. And, um, you know, there's very few movies today that I mean, they, they, they come out every so often, but that really have a full female human being on screen that's not some kind of male projection of it or not some kind of female uh, reaction to some male projection. You know, it's, it's like she's a whole woman on the screen, and um, I'm very proud of that collaboration for... I think Julie's performance. You know, I know what, what she's... what, what her contribution as a writer was too and how deep and profound it was to both those films so she's the th I forget why I was talking about that because you just went on from mm -hmm. whether it was autobiographical to, oh, whether it was to autobiographical. the collaboration yeah. between you yeah, and Richard right. and her it's not that I mean it is autobiographical and it's not because before before sunset which is the second one right yes yeah. Um, that's got, a, I mean, there you are in Paris, you're writing, presenting a book, and then... Yeah, well, I mean, what's funny is that it's, it's like a, what's the word, it's a parallel life. The, you know, and um, we always knew we wanted to make a second movie, and then Rick came to one of my um, book readings in Austin. I was doing a book tour, and I was, you know, at the such and such bookshop in Austin, Texas, doing this reading, and... And Rick was there, and he came up to me afterwards. He goes, what if this is how they met? Again, you know, they lost each other, and he wrote a book about her, and she came to the reading, and that's how they met again. Wouldn't that be great? And I was like, yes. And that's how it started. So, I mean, you know, you, you know the, the real life and, you know, uh, film life are, are, are intertwined uh, in a way that's impossible to take apart. In Before Sunset and Chelsea Walls, you make references to Dylan Thomas. Before Sunrise, I reference Dylan Thomas because I'm impersonating Dylan Thomas reading W.H. Auden in Before Sunrise as I walked out one evening walking down Bristol Street. Um, and then in Chelsea Walls, I have Dylan Thomas narrate the movie. That's just coincidence. I mean, I, I happen to be a big Dylan Thomas fan, but I was making a movie about the Chelsea Hotel and Dylan Thomas died there. And so it seemed appropriate to use some of his poetry to, uh, and also I didn't write Chelsea Walls, but it's, it's aspiring to be a kind of under Milkwood of the Chelsea Hotel where you're just hearing all the voices. And so I wanted to draw out that reference. Do you like Dylan Thomas's work? Oh, I love it. Why? Because he's such a pie, he's such a liver of life. He just seems to be eating life and loving people and he's such a charismatic figure. 
And he knows language. I mean, the guy eats language for breakfast. I mean, it's just... You've that, written how many books? Now? I've written two books. Now, I suppose you being Ethan Hawke didn't hurt getting them published. But Certainly. Ethan Hawke, the writer, how did he feel about that side to it? Oh, there's a natural suspicion that I think a, a certain critical mind has whenever a celebrity writes or publishes anything, which is very healthy, I think. Because you can't be sure. You know, if so-and-so, Philip McGeehy, writes a novel, and you know that that novel got published because that novel, somebody thought it was really good. Um, because there would be no other reason to publish it. But if I write a book, there's a chance, a very good chance, that somebody was publishing it simply because they thought they could sell some copies based on the fact that I was a famous actor. Um, so that suspicion, I think, would be wildly healthy. Um, and that I think if I'm a serious writer, I don't care about that. I mean, I've got to try to use whatever skills and resources I have to get my art out there into the world and let readers and time decide whether it's any good or not. Um, and the funny thing is, one of the things that I've grown to be very proud of about both books is that they've overcome that skepticism. And I think that that, uh, that means a lot to me, actually. Do you find writing easy or hard? Do you use a computer or a pen? I don't think anybody who knows much about writing finds it easy. Uh, it's, it's so difficult to do well, to have anything to say, to find a unique voice, to access your own, you know, well of, I don't know. I mean, it's very difficult to do. Some people can't help but do it. I mean, you know, Dylan Thomas couldn't do anything else. Um, one of the things that bothers me a little bit right now is that I love writing and nothing makes me happier. But I get so much fulfillment from the other things I do in my life that uh, I'm, it's taking me a really long time to finish a third book. And uh, it's mostly because I kind of want to fly to Italy for the premiere of my, I mean, <laughs> it's like it's, I, I, I have so much fun stuff to do in my life. I'm very fortunate, you know? And, um, and sometimes one, my other two books I've been driven to write out of necessity and probably the third one will happen that way too. What do you mean by necessity? I just have to get it out, you know? You can't sleep quietly until... Yeah, that <laughs> just feeling like, uh, I, can't, I can't make that trip until I get that out, you know? Now, some people, including myself, see Training Day as a point where you took a drastic turn in terms of the characters you're playing. Now that may be because I and they haven't seen a previous film where you took a drastic turn. Mm -hmm. But was it a drastic turn? Were you looking to... Uh, no, I just think from... I mean, you're not the first person to say that to me. Um, and I think that it's just the first film I had done in a while that people had seen. <laughs> That's how I felt about it. Um, if I had to mark a transition for myself, it would be the film I did right before Training Day, which was Tape, which is a Richard Linkletter film um, where I feel like I found myself as an adult actor, and Training Day is a manifestation of that. Um, every, it marks a line there for me. This, you know. But also, you know, Training Day, you gotta, Denzel Washington is a great actor, you know? He really is. He's a great movie star and a great actor and, a, and an icon. And um, it's like going five sets with, uh, uh, you know, Andre Agassi or something. You don't have to win. Going five sets is, uh, is impressive. So I think that people saw that as a, as a, departure for me or an arrival for me however you want to look at it and, and I knew that there had been a lot of work that went into my being able to do that um, and I knew before I went there that I could do it 
you knew the f going into the film that it was going to probably have a higher profile than maybe Tate being mm, certainly. Um, was it important for you to, for it to for you to work? I mean, I imagine it's important in every film you do, but I mean, in this case, you knew something. Some was films are more on. important than others. Yeah, yeah. And there was something riding on Training Day, wasn't there? Um. Something riding on training? Yeah. Day. You know, again, I don't think like that. What was riding on training day for me was I wanted to um, take the level of comfort and confidence that I felt working alone in a room with Richard Linkletter and Robert Sean Leonard and stuff, old friends of mine, and be able to do it in a mainstream Hollywood movie, to be that confident and that comfortable. And I, I didn't, when you say writing, I, like I cared how it turned out or how it did, I, my, my brain really doesn't think like that. I wanted to, um, Denzel Washington can eat actors for breakfast. And you know what, I wanted to help him be great. And I thought if he had to help carry my dead weight around, then it'd be a waste of his time. And I wanted to, I wanted to be as real and full and vibrant as he was and not, let him do the work for me. And I thought that if I did that, then he would truly excel. And that was my kind of mission on that movie. I assume you were happy for him when he won the Oscar. I was ecstatic. You know, from the time I read the script, I thought, well, if I do my job right, then Denzel Washington will win the Academy Award for this movie. Because, uh, I, you know, so I, I mean, I saw myself as an assist man on that movie. So I, I felt like mission accomplished when that happened. Not a phrase we use lightly these days, mission. <laughs> yeah, right. Lord of War. Yes, Back Andrew Nichol. It was just an opportunity to work with Andrew Nichol again. I love Andrew, and um, Andrew's a serious, uh, you know, Andrew's a political writer. Um, there's very few, I mean, I, I feel like if this were a different time period, Andrew should have government subsidy. He should get to make every script. I've read so many scripts of his. They're all, they're all so good. Andrew Nichol is a great writer. And um, I played a smaller part in that movie to try to help make sure it got made hmm. and distributed. And you're very good too, sir. Very Thank good you. too, sir. Training Day, Lord of War, Assault on Precinct 13. And you almost, you've got a taste for... It was my little trifecta of... Um, you know, Training Day did something. The success of it did affect me in a certain way, which is that I, could, I, feel, I felt the power of mainstream entertainment. And, I mean, how, well, we would have never gotten Before Sunset made without Training Day. We wanted to make that movie for a long time. Several things came together for that to happen, but one is me getting nominated for an Academy Award for Training Day helped push somebody to give us a tiny amount of money to make that movie. Um, that was very helpful. And, uh, and I also realized that, well, I was a grown up now and that I, I liked all these 70s action movies. You know, I liked uh, French Connection and, uh, and I was like, well, you know, I'll play a cop. I'll try it out, see how it goes. I liked all those, all three of those movies. Training Day, Assault on Precinct 13, and Lord of War are my cop movies, you know? And I like them all. I mean, do you enjoy that, the, the bang, bang, bang side of things? <laughs> you can't be a famous movie actor today and not, like, hold a gun at some point. I, I tried for a long time, you know. Uh, so I guess you can do it. I just gave in. <laughs> gave in? Well, I gave in on Training Day, and it seemed to be worthwhile. So anyway, there was quite a bit riding on Training Day. Not going into it, but coming out of it. Yeah, that's it. Riding on it, it implies to me that you mean that I wanted something from it. Um, I didn't want anything from it, but to have a good experience. I really didn't. Uh, I, the great thing about being a young actor and doing all this stuff, uh, success and failure are so both incredibly tricky entities. I don't know if I'm going to get the quotation 100% right, but so, so why is it, do you think, that when we're young, people tell us we can be anything we want to be, right. and when we get older, they get offended if we try? Right. That's a line from The Hottest State. 
And that's a line that came out of uh, You know, uh, it came out of feeling so much criticism about wanting to be a writer. Everybody tells their kids that they can be whatever they want to be. You know, all of a sudden I was in Dead Poets Society. I wasn't allowed to do it. I'd be mocked for it, teased and made fun of. I remember reading in the, you know, one review of, before the book had come out, you know, talking about how I was performing oral sex on myself. And like, it's a pretty public paper. And thinking, it, nobody even read it, it was just announced that it was gonna be published. And I remember thinking, God, what did I do? That, what did I do that was so horrible that I shouldn't be allowed to do this? And then I realized that, you know, you can't feel sorry for yourself. That, hey, I can do it. Do, you know, and it doesn't mean that everybody has to be nice to you about it. You know, people don't have to be nice to you. In fact, the reason why it feels so good when they are is because most of the time they're not. You know, what's so wonderful about falling in love is that it doesn't happen all the time. You know? Uh, so, I, you know, it's, it's, but I remember that line is exactly why Catalina decided to do the movie. Because, you know, somehow that line has really struck a chord with her. Um, it's actually one of my favorite moments in that movie, too. She delivers it so well. You proud of the hottest state? You... The film? Yeah. Yeah. You know, the thing is about the, the movie to me isn't mine. You know, it's now about Mark and Catalina and Chris Knorr, the cinematographer, and Jesse Harris, who wrote all the music. It's this, I, I, I mean, I know that it's this wildly autobiographical piece and everything, but it doesn't feel like it to me. Um, it was something I always wanted to do, and now I feel like it's off my chest and I can move on. I, I don't know. I, I loved the collaboration, the set design, you know, choosing the cars, you know, so much fun, figuring out how loud the music should be, getting to be in charge. You know, you spend all that time as an actor and you feel like, oh, that scene would have been better. Why'd they cut there? They ruined it. You know, ah, now it's just like every other piece of junk. Um, and, or all my fights with Alfonso, you know. Well, and also, it's also very humbling, you know, because you realize that a lot of other times people like the way the other people did it better. You're 36 years old. Mm -hmm. You've made, I'm credited with 39 films, believe it or not. Yeah. You've done three as a director. Yeah. Now what in all this time do you think you've learned? I think, you know, if I, I it sounds like a gimmick or something, you know, but uh, I try to be a student all the time. It's why I like to put myself in situations where I'm a novice, whether it's writing a book or making a film or something like that. Uh, or, you know, a couple of years ago, I did Shakespeare on a Broadway stage for the first time. I like to put myself in situations where I feel over my, you know, in over my head, because uh, those are usually where you learn the most. Um, but I have, you know, if I've learned anything, it would be that uh, I was so much older then, I'm younger than that now. You know, uh, what I was took, it's a Dylan line, but, uh, I only now know how little I know. When I was 22, I thought I knew a lot. Are you an existential romantic or something? Like <laughs> an existential romantic, maybe. Why well, are you a method actor? I don't think people know what the expression method actor means. People think a method actor means that you, uh, I guess they think it means that you're in character all the time or something, or that you, the method is in reference to Stanislavski, and in terms of Stanislavski, I, I, that's always, if I had a technique, it would be the method. But I certainly am not a method actor. I, I, I've, I would call myself a first person actor, which is that uh, I try to use what little emotional knowledge I may possess um, 
to inform a character and make it personal under the aspiration that if it's personal and meaningful to me, that some like-minded individual, it might carry some true significance for it. You know, um, there's this, another kind of actor that is generally a better kind, which is the third person actor. Like Philip Hoffman, uh, I would call a, a, a third person actor, is a character study. You know, he studies people. Um, um, Robert De Niro's a third person actor. Um, Do you mean that they put on a guise rather than bringing it out of themselves? That's a simple, simple way of saying it. I mean that I've never been that good at being, at studying other people and mimicking them and impersonating them. And some people can do this the wild. You did a good job, didn't oh, you? Oh, thanks. But that's, that's just imitation. What, what, you know, Robert De Niro does is an imitation. He studies human beings and, and brings things to light, like, like authors who can write lots of different kinds of people. Then you have an author like Kerouac who's just using himself or Salinger or something like that. But then, you know, the, the genius of Leo Tolstoy, you, you, you know, he sees into, he could write a chapter on this interview, you know, and the, the pe people operating the camera and the people, the person who drove me here today and you and, uh, y y you know, and we'd see how all these worlds are colliding in this moment and how much we're all missing each other. We're not even in the same room with each other. You know, uh, there's certain kind of actors that can do that, that, you know, I, I admire that. I've always aspired to do a little bit more of that. How but much I, does it annoy you to have your private life dragged through the morning talk shows? One of the things why I think I've had such a happy life is I have incredible powers of denial. I choose not to think about things that I feel are not helpful to me. And so gossip. You know, people gossip, whether you're a movie actor, or whether you're not a movie actor, you know. You sleep with your best friend's girlfriend, you know. People are going to gossip about it, you know. You, uh, people don't, it's hard to think about why we're born and when we're going to die and what we're going to do while we're here. It's much more fun to make fun of people for having acne, you know, um, or screwing up their lives. Yeah. I mean, people do it, so. Um, it's, uh, you know, I've reaped great benefits from this profession. And I think it would be, uh, show a lack of class is to focus on the few ways in which it's been difficult. Ethan Hawke. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Indeed. My pleasure.